Hey everyone, welcome back to another review of the new book. As always, my name is Jay, and this I'm going to be going over this video. I'm going to be going over the new chapter approved, 2019. Cool, 2019 edition. So before we begin, if you went, if you will go and purchase the 2019 edition of Chapter Approved, it also comes with a secondary book, the Munistorum, the Munitorum Field Manual. Now the Munitorum Field Manual is just filled with points changes and point like all stat lines and stuff. I'll summarize that in, a, in another video if you wish. Um, most people have already gone over the big changes to most of the armies. I am happy. I think some of the uh, Forgeable Imperial Knights went down in cost. Correct me if I'm wrong. But that's good because it's what they needed. Um, they were way too points cut, you know, points heavy. And so the new chapter approved is out. Now, what does this book contain? You might ask. That is the million dollar question. If you were to pay a million dollars for this book, but I think it's only like 40 bucks. Um, it contains a couple new rules, not really newish rules, some tweaks, but they've been, GW has been really good keeping this continuum of rules going. Um, it does have, um, some updated rules for some demons. If you were a demons player, you're going to love this, I think. Um, for, it also has, it, um, updated rules and points costs for all the, uh, fortifications. Imperial fortifications, pretty much. Um... That's cool, yeah. So then they've upgraded, they've you know changed the points. Some are slightly cheaper. They do a little more damage. Um, they has new missions, which is good. Both if you're a um, just a standard mission player, or uh, if you love the mails from a war, you know both of them have some nice uh, missions, and we'll go over those after. Um, but it also has a couple other things, and we'll go over them. So first of all. Uh, it breaks up into multiple sections, right? And we're going to go over the sections pretty efficiently. But um, so the first part is about open war. Now, open war, of course, is you can just have fun, play the open war cards, which are actually a lot of fun to do the random missions. Uh, you can play as many points as you want. It's uh, just a lot of fun. And so, of course, there's actually a cool way of... Um, they decided to put some ways of that you can enhance your games for open war. One's called drafting cards. So instead of following the normal instructions for drawing open war cards, use the following. Decide which player is player A, and which player will be player B. If you cannot decide, simply roll off, re-rolling, ties, winner is player A. Player A takes the deck of deployment cards, selects three of them, and lays them down in front of player B. Player B then selects one of these to be used in our mission. Player B then takes the deck of objective cards, and selects three and lays them down in front of player A. Player A then selects one of these objective cards for the mission. Player A then takes the deck of twist cards, removes the many paths to victory and double or nothing cards. Oh, I like those ones. Then shuffles the remaining cards and deals them into two piles. Each player then takes one of these piles, selects one twist card, and places it face down in front of them. Once both players have selected a twist card, both players reveal their choice. Both of these twists will apply during the mission. Cool. Follow the rules using reuses and sudden death cards. That sounds like a fun way to have a game. It really does. And then the other one, Secret Agenda. Uh, instead of following the normal instructions for drawing open war cards, do the following. Select which player will be player A, which one will be player B, roll off, you can't decide. Player A shuffles the deck of deployment cards, draws the top cards, normal and determine the deployment map for the mission. Player B shuffles the objective cards, does the same. Player then takes the twist cards, removes the many paths of victory, double or nothing. Set peace battle and meeting battle cards, then shuffles the remaining cards and deals them to two piles. Each player then takes one of these piles, selects one twist card, and places it face down in front of them. At the start of the battle round, at the start of the battle round, each player rolls a d6. On a four up, that player reveals their twist card. Uh, that twist now applies for the rest of the battle. Ouch. If an effect of the twist applies from the first battle round, treat the current battle round as if it was the first for purposes of the twist. Player B then shuffles the re the ruse cards and deals one to each player face down. These are kept secret until they are played. Player A then shuffles the sudden death cards and deals one to each player face down. They are kept secret until they're played. That's cool. And number three, method three, covert operations. Once again, side who's player A. Player A shuffles the deck of deployment cards and draws the top card to norm as normal to determine the deployment type of the mission. Player B shovels the sudden death cards and deals two to each player face down. These are kept secret until they're played. Sudden death cards must be played as soon as their conditions are met. However, a player does not immediately win the battle when they play one of the sudden death cards. Instead, a player must play both of their sudden death cards to immediately win the battle. Player A then takes the deck of twist cards, removes the many paths of victory, shuffle, um, 
shuffles the remaining cards and deals one face up. That twist applies to the end of the battle. That's cool. Uh, the rules of using ruses apply as described in the rules insert card included with the open war card pack. Cool. And then there's also an open war army generator where you roll d6. Uh, depending on the size of the game you want, you choose a different amount, you roll d6, and it generates, you know, a certain number of units. Like if you roll two dice and it was a five and a four, you get two champion units or three unit troop units or heavy support unit. You just roll until you generate enough points. That's cool. Another fun way to, um, to create a fun open war game. You know, it may not be the most balanced game, but it'll be fun. And that's the important part of the game as well. It's a fun game, right? Next up, we have narrative play, which is a really cool way to, you know, form narr uh, narrative campaigns. Um, there's, a, so it, of course, it talks about spearhead, um, tank aces. So tank aces, each, um, basically, before the battle, you can use the following stratagem, which is the tank ace stratagem for one slash three command points, depending on what you're using it on. Use a stratagem before the battle. Pick one vehicle model in your army that is not Titanic for one CP or one Titanic vehicle that is your army for three CP. Add one to hit rolls made for that vehicle until the end of the battle. In addition, reroll hit rolls of one for friendly vehicle models with their, with, well, they're within um, six inches of this model. You can only use a stratagem once per battle. That's nasty. Very, very nasty. And then it has some parts like battle zone tank graveyard, so it's spearhead missions. There's a uh, wall of iron, trap is sprung, counterattack, spearhead stratagems. You know, so it's fun games for spearhead. As I mentioned, it's really cool. Really, really cool. Linked games. This is the new one. And I thought this was a really cool idea. Now, I always wanted to do this um, for a campaign. If I ever did a campaign, was start off small. Go kill team, then 40k, then apocalypse. And you increase the size each one. And this is basically a way of doing it. Um, so it starts off small, and you can... It, the games are linked, right? So it starts off small... So it goes to Kill Team, then 40k, then Apocalypse. And there's two ways to create a linked game. Uh, inspired, which using with this method, the organizer will create each round as the story progresses. The events and outcomes of each game will inspire those that follow, creating a dynamic and authentic tale in keeping with the situation the players and their armies find themselves. After each round, the organizers should consider the consequences of the game played and where its narrative takes them to the next round. And the next one's Orchestrated. Uh, it requires the organizer to plan each round ahead of time. This allows the players to build a specific combination of events and cover any aims they may have. For example, if both players want to play a game of Apocalypse using Titanic units, this can be planned into the linked games. Organizing each round, uh, sorry, each round around this key criteria. Cool. And then the talks about the organizer's structure, uh, the narration of it, and the battle outcomes. And it's really cool. Battle outcomes are rewards or penalties for players based on the results of the battle. So as I said, you can, um, you can like, here are some examples of outcomes that you can use in the many of your games. Choice of mission, choice of deployment zones, additional command points or command assets, additional units or, or access to certain types of units, additional warlord traits, additional levels of relics, um, on, you know, and uh, automatically win initiative for the first battle round and the first battle, automatically win the roll off to see who goes first. That'd be cool. Um... There's also a couple of rules like superior positioning. The player can set up D3 models or units or one detachment um, off the battlefield. And then at the end of one of the movement phases, bring it in. It sets up reinforcements. There's reinforcements, fearless, you know, a bunch of other rules that it could have. But it's really cool. So basically you start out as a, um, as a kill team. From the kill team you go on to 40k, from 40k on to Apocalypse. And there's a few missions. One's called Assault from the Scrap Cities, War of Nightmares... Um, let's go over one, for example. So Assault on Scrap Cities, round one, Kill Team. So it talks about, you know, a bit of a storyline, mission sweep and clear, Kill Team Core Manual, Kill Zone, Wall Mortis, and Battle Outcomes. In the next round, the winner has the first turn. Do not roll and their opponents cannot seize. And if their army's Battle Forge gains two additional command points. So there you go. You see the, it starts stacking for the next round. Round two, 40k, mission, no mercy. Or Forlorn Charge which is the Annihilus Vigilant Defiant. Uh, battle Zone Wasteland and Dust Storm. Wasteland and Dust Storm. Battle outcomes in the next battle round. The winner generates one additional command point, command asset each turn. Using, uh, when using the sustained assault rule, the winner's opponent cannot make any reinforcement rolls for super heavy detachments in their army. And must subtract one from the dice rolls made to see if reinforcement detachments in their army arrives. And then round three, Apocalypse. Mission, Meat Grinder. 
Uh, the orc player is the defender, regardless of army powers. Of course, this is for an orc, orc player. Warzone, Sector Mechanicus, albeit an orc version. And a battle come, the player wins this round, they are the overall winner. Cool. So here you go, it stacks up. And the cool thing about this is it does continue. It's kind of a positive feedback loop, so if your opponent wins round one, it'll help stack towards the RS, but it's a, it's a fun continuum. And as I said, they have a bunch of different um, ones, and I think people can easily take these and um, create their own in a very much linked fashion, right? Take this in inspiration, tweak a couple rules, tweak the army rules, go for it, you know? There's also parallel battles. So the rules presented on uh, the following pages offer guidance on how to link Kill Team with Warm 4K and Apocalypse to create one epic conflict offering players a dynamic experience. Again, you link them all. There's a Death From Above, Secure the Artifact, Saboteurs, which is cool. Those challenge missions. So what is a narrative challenge mission? These missions are designed to provide a different experience than the missions usually present in Warm 40k publications. Narrative challenge missions allow you to fight out those hopeless situations all too often presented to commanders at the various forces at war within the galaxy of the 41st millennium. One player will take command of the disadvantaged force, those whose margin of success is measured in how long they can survive or how many of the foe they can destroy before themselves are slain. Instead of using the normal victory conditions, uh, to players in the game. The player fighting from the position of disadvantage will instead receive a rating from one to five stars based on how well they perform. Their opponent has to has the challenge of their own in attempting to ensure the disadvantaged player scores a low challenge rating. To get the most from these missions, players should switch roles after the first battle and refight the mission, with the new disadvantaged player being the other person. And there's ways to earn uh, points, basically. That's really cool. That's very, very cool. And so, um, for example, in, in one of the missions, that they, it's called Last Stand. There's stratagems as well that you can use. It's a really cool battlefield. Um, but um, basically, the battle length, the battle lasts until the defender has no remaining units on the battlefield, and it goes depending on how long they go. So if the battle, if the disadvantaged player gets wiped out between rounds one and three, they get one star. Round four, two stars. Five, three stars. Six, three, four stars. Seven, Five stars. Cool. And there's an attacker and defendum stratagem. And that's each one. Like in the next one, it's it's um, defender's kill points total, which dictates the number of stars, defender's victory points. That's cool. Very, very cool stuff. And then up to the, the final part, my favorite, matched play. So there's some new battle fronts, apparently, uh, where there's is it battle brothers are the same. <coughs> Um, there's new missions, of course, as I mentioned, that we're going to go over. Um, prepare positions the same as before. It just gives cover for two command points before the battle if you go second. Uh, psychic focus. And pretty much all the rules here are the same. They kept it very similar as last year's. Um, just the different missions are the parts that are, are interesting. Of course, Eternal War is Crusade. Um, which is, there's an objective marker that must be set up anywhere on the battlefield, more than 12 inches away from objective marker. So there's two objective markers on the table. Victory conditions. Starting from the second battle round, each player scores one victory point for each objective marker they control. Um, oh, sorry, there's six markers. So there's six markers on the table. And um, six markers on the table, you get one point for every one they control. A player controls an objective if they have more models than three inches of the center than the opponents. Say the World of First Blood Line Breaker. Scorched Earth. Um, so in this one, the victory conditions are. Uh, let's see how many. Tr um, Six objective markers again, and they have controller raise. Starting from the second battle round, each player scores one victory point for each objective marker they control at the start of their turn. If an objective marker is within the enemy's deployment zone, you can choose to raise it if you control it. Doing so scores you three victory points instead of one, but the objective marker is then removed from the battlefield. That's pretty sweet. A player controls an objective marker if they have more models than three inches than their opponent. That's really cool. Ascension. That sounds familiar. Um... So once again, there's three objective markers on the, the battlefield. The first one is placed in the center of the battlefield. Then, starting with the defender, the players each place one more objective marker. That must be f more than uh, 15 inches away from any objective marker, more than 6 inches away from battlefield edge, and equal distance from both players' deployment zones. That's interesting. 
Um, that's going to be fun to measure. The attacker deploys the entire army first, defender their entire army second, as usual. Uh, so victory conditions. Ascend. Each player scores 150 point at the end of the, each turn uh, for each objective marker they control. A player controls an objective marker if they have more models than 3 inches. Furthermore, if a player controls the same objective marker with the same character for more than one of their turns consecutively, the number of victory points scored is increased. So 2 the second time, and then 3, and then 4, I guess. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That, that's going to be stacks. So you put a character on an objective and basically force your opponent to kill it. That's nasty. The uh, Frontline Warfare, um, once again, has objective markers as normal. Uh, there's four objective markers in this one. Uh, take and hold. At the end of each battle round, each player scores a number of victory points for each objective marker they control. The player scores one victory point if they control the objective marker in their deployment zone, four if they control the objective marker in their the opponent's deployment zone, and two victory points for each objective marker that they can... for each... Other objective marker they control. Okay. So one of it's in my deployment zone, four of it's in your deployment zone, two of it's outside of our deployment zones. Player controls more, mo you know, same thing. Say the Warlord, Line Breaker. First Blood, First Strike. Sorry, First Strike, not First Blood in this. The Four Pillars. Um, once again, you place... This is the one with uh, objective markers being placed accordingly. One in the center. No, sorry. Place four objective markers as follows. Draw imaginary lines from the center. Battlefield towards each corner and place them halfway through. So there's one in each, you know, break up the table in the fourth quarters. Um, victory conditions, siphon power. At the end of each battle round, if one player controls more objective markers than their opponent, they score one victory point. If they control all four objectives, they score three points. And a player controls objective marker if they have more models with the troops battlefield roll within three inches of, than, of it than their opponent does. Cool. No prisoners. At the end of each battle round, a player scores one victory point if more units from your, their opponent's army were destroyed during that battle round than their own army. And then slay the warlord for strike line breaker. And for all these missions, acceptable casualties, so the match play rules of sudden death do not apply. Um, let's see here. Good. Eternal War Lockdown. So, uh, once again, deployment. It's... Hmm, I don't think it's objectives. Is there? Yes, yeah, six objectives. Yeah, six so objectives, victory conditions, target secured. Each player scores one victory point at the end of their t each turn of their turns for each objective marker that they control. A player controls an objective marker if they have more models than three inches. Dominance. If at the at the end of each battle round, a player scores one victory point if they control more objective markers than their opponent. A player controls an objective marker. Once again, same thing. So, all right, that's cool. And lockdown. At the start of each at the first battle round, but before the first player begins. The player taking the first turn selects one objective marker to be objective marker one. The player taking the second turn then selects one objective marker to be objective marker six. The player is taking the first turn then selects one objective marker that has not been numbered and rolls an 1d6 rolling. Cool, so you assign the numbers that way. At the start of each battle round, after the first, remove from the battlefield the objective marker whose number corresponds to the current battle round. That's interesting. For example, at the start of battle round three, the objective marker number three would be removed. So basically you choose your opponent's one and you go, that's number one. Okay. Wow, that's nasty. So then you have to figure it out. So you basically, if you camp on an objective, the other person will knock it out. Cool. <coughs> Next to Schemes of War, to play Maelstrom of War missions, uh, use the following pages. There's Constructing Your Own Objective deck, using Tactical Objectives, of course. That's cool. You can use, there's some uh, stratagems, like Reprioritize, re use stratagem at the start of your turn, discard any two from your hand, and draw a new Tactical Objective card for each card that was discarded. Excuse me. Uh, so the Maelstrom of War missions are Covert Maneuvers. Once again, place the six objective markers. Um, same thing as before, acceptable casualties, so no sudden death. Covert maneuvers at the start of each battle round after the first. If there is a player with fewer victory points than their opponent, then for the rest of the battle, all tactical objectives that player puts into play can be placed face down, and all face-up tactical objectives that the player has in play can be turned face down for the rest of that battle. All tactical objectives their opponent puts into play must be placed face up. 
and all face down tactical objectives their opponent has in play must be turned face up. Interesting. Okay. And obviously whoever has the most points at the end of the, bat the game wins. Slay the Warlord, first strike, line breaker. Ambitious Surge. Uh, six objective mark. Oh, there's six objectives for all these, of course. Um, acceptable casualties. Ambitious Surge. At the start of each player's movement phase, if that player has any tactical objective cards in play, their opponent must select one of those tactical objectives. If that tactical objective is achieved in that turn or the subsequent turn, it is worth one additional victory point. Cool. Same thing, victory conditions, say the Warlord. Cards in those points, say the Warlord, first strike, line breaker. Critical objective. The big thing about critical objective is at the start of each player's turn, before putting any tactical objectives into play, that player can select one tactical objective card from their discard pile and shuffle it back into their objective deck. That's cool. That's a cool mission. Victory conditions, say the Warlord, line breaker. First strike. Whoever has the most points. Disruptive tactics. At the start of each player's turn, before putting any tactical objectives into play, that player reveals the top three cards from their deck. If that objective deck has fewer than three cards remaining, reveal as many as are available. That opponent, that player's opponent, can then select one of those cards to be placed on the bottom of that player's objective deck, and the remaining cards are returned to the top of the deck in an order of the opponent's choice. Ouch. So that's pretty nasty. Victory conditions, same as always. Whoever has the most points, say the word, first strike, line breaker. Territorial control. At the start of each player's turn, after the first, if that player controls more objective markers than their opponent, they can draw one card from their objective deck before placing any ob tactical objectives into play. That's nice. That's kind of cool. And of course, say the warlord, line breaker, first blood, first strike. Confined command. Um, at the start of each player's movement phase, their opponent can select one tactical objective that player has in play. That tactical objective is returned to the owning player's hand, and they can put a different tactical objective into play. Again, these are fun. These are really fun games. Where was the most points? That's it, right? And then the appendix, which I'm going to skim over. Basically, demons got a huge amount of new rules. I'm not a big demons. I don't know a lot about demons. So I'm just going to skip over this. There have been some already really good reviews on this subject, but go check them out. And then uh, Fortifications as well. The Age Defense Line, Imperial Bastion, Imperial Defense Line, Imperial Bunker, Vengeance Weapon Batteries, uh, Firestorm Readout, Plasma Obliterator. I should, try, I should try a Plasma Obliterator in games right now. It's kind of fun. So I should definitely try it sometime. That'd be kind of a fun thing to do. Put down a Plasma Obliterator and have some fun. All right? Um, start shooting stuff across the board. Uh, there's also the Macro Cannon Aquila Strong Point, Vortex Missile Aquila Strong Point, Void Shield Generator, Sky Shield Landing Pad, which I have a proxy for, Fortress of Redemption, Chaos Bastion, right? And then just, you know, summations of uh, Battlefield Terrain, what gives what to cover, pretty much all the same as before, to my knowledge. Uh, yeah, pretty much. So cool stuff, cool stuff, and there you go. So those are the new missions, the new things about Chapter Approved. What do you think about it overall? I think it's pretty cool. Adds a little bit of diversity to the game, some new ways to play the game. I really like the linked missions. Uh, the new Maelstrom games are fun, and the new Eternal War missions are a lot of fun too. They're going to be fun. I can't wait to play them with my friends, you know, Dave and Stu and everyone, and just have, some, and have a good time. Right? It looks like a good time. And that's what I like about these Chapter Approved, is that every year they tweak the rules slightly. There is the Munitorum um, rules, which, you know, update the field manual, which updates all the points as well. Um... Yeah, it's good stuff. Good stuff. So as I said, huge thank you for all you watching. Leave comments in the comment section down below what you think about this, uh, the new chapter approved, um, 2019. What do you think about it? Let's create a discussion in the comment section down below. As always, this video is brought to you by my Patreon campaign. Link in the description below if you want to help support my videos. It's because of them that I can make these videos. And as you see their names go by my head, I can't thank them enough. And if you want to help, I'd appreciate it too. So stay tuned for more reviews. Till next time, this is Jay saying happy painting. Mm-hmm.